Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our forum panel discussion titled Extension Taking the Long View. I'm Michael Ord, and I serve as Vice Provost for Extension and Director of Extension here at Mizzou. This topic, Extension Taking the Long View uh, for the Future, is important in a number of ways, I think, today at this particular point in time. It's important for the future of higher education in general and, and for sure the future of land-grant universities. And it's particularly important today at this time as, this, as, we're, as we're into the 175th anniversary of Mizzou, the 100th anniversary of Extension, and our hope in Extension to be looking at and focusing on the next century, and the inauguration of our new chancellor, Dr. Bowen Lofton. All of those things come together for us today. So I think it's a really good time to have a discussion uh, to talk about the future uh, of extension in the long view. We have a group of outstanding individuals to help us discuss that topic today. All three of these individuals are recipients of the C. Bryce Ratchford Fellowship Award. And this fellowship recognizes achievements in extension, international education, and or agricultural economics. And we have a one-pager about the Ratchford Award and about Dr. Ratchford at the tables. And I'd ask you, if you would, uh, grab hold of those and pass them along so people can, can learn, if you haven't already, about uh, Dr. Ratchford and the, the fellowship program that, uh, that is a part of the university awards system. Dr. Ratchford, of course, was University of Missouri system president. And prior to that, Director of Extension during the 1960s and 1970s here. So with that, let me introduce the group that will be leading the discussion. First, Dr. Ron Turner. He's Executive Vice President Emeritus, University of Missouri System. Dr. Turner also served as Vice President for University Outreach and Extension. Dr. Turner also served as director of University of Missouri's South Africa Education Program during the first 18 years of its existence, and that program continues today. He served as, senior, as a senior fellow in the Harry S. Truman School of Public Affairs, and Ron received the Ratchford Award in 2009. Next, is doc, in the middle there, is Dr. Rob Kallenbach. He's professor and state extension specialist in the Division of Plant Sciences in the College of Agriculture, Food, and Natural Resources. Rob also serves as the Plant Sciences Division Extension Leader. And he's a project leader for research and extension on forage crops that is recognized nationally and globally for that work. Dr. Kallenbach has been named this year the Excellence in Extension Award winner by the Extension Committee on organization and policy, some of us know as ECOP, as the top extension educator in the nation. Rob received the Ratchford Fellowship Award in 2011. Down at the end there is Dr. Michael Cook. Mike serves as the Robert D. Partridge Endowed Professor in Cooperative Leadership in the Division of Social Sciences in the College of Agriculture, Food, and Natural Resources. In addition, he serves as executive director of GICL, the Graduate Institute for Cooperative Leadership, where he has a research and outreach effort. He coordinates the development of, global network, of a global network of scholars and practitioners in understanding patron-owned organizations, some of us know as cooperatives. And Mike received the Ratchford Fellowship Award in the year 2000. So first and foremost, we want this to be as informal as we can make it. Uh, we want to uh, allow for di dialogue and questions and comments uh, throughout. And here's the plan for that. Each of these group members will, uh, in turn, make a few in, uh, in, in initial comments. And at that stage, when they're finished, if someone just has an absolute burning question or comment, uh, we'd urge you to go ahead and ask that. But only about one. Because what we want to do is try to get through all of the folks uh, as we move forward. Then, as we finish the third speaker, as Mike has finished, uh, we, will, we will turn it open to everyone, uh, panel members and even me, maybe, asking questions and comments of each other. And most importantly, 
questions and comments from you all in the group so that we can talk about this taking the long view issue. So um, I'm going to be the timekeeper, and there's a big old clock back there, so I can make sure that we don't get outside of our time area, because it's a busy day, if you haven't noticed. Lots of stuff going on, including the inauguration of Bowen. So I'll be the timekeeper, and uh, we'll make sure we stay on time. Uh, the other thing I'd mention, if you haven't noticed, is that we're recording this. And so everyone needs to be sure they speak into a mic whenever they make a comment uh, during, the, during the proceedings. We have about uh, four roving mics back here. So before you start, make sure you grab a hold of one of those so that we can get the audio part of your, of your question or comment. And so with that, Ron Turner, you're up. Thank you, Michael. I have a five-minute speech and a 10-minute speech. It's the same speech, but in the long one, I lose my place a lot. <laughs> I have six minutes, and I've started the stopwatch. And at, by working three weeks, as Bob uh, uh, mentioned a while ago, I've narrowed this down to 32 minutes. So hang on. <laughs> Bryce uh, Ratchford believed that universities have a unique role to play in the advancement of the greater good of society. He saw citizen engagement as a driving principle of the land-grant university. He not only believed in this principle, he acted on it. And through his leadership, established the extension framework through which the University of Missouri carries out its public service mission across the entire state. His concept of citizen engagement went far beyond rhetorical flourishes. He sought to make outreach and extension the responsibility of the entire academy. He did so because of a populist belief that the university belongs to the people and exists to serve them, their families, communities, and businesses. And his commitment to the extension mission of the land-grant university marked him as an educator and as a human being. Now today's panel provides an opportunity to think again about how universities add value to the lives and life prospects of all citizens. Those who attend universities as well as those who will never set foot on a university campus. It's also time for us to think about public value in addition to the private value and to examine the future of extension and the land grant mission in an era of rapid transition toward privatization. If the trend toward privatization continues at the present pace, the role of extension will come under increasing pressure to privatize as well. To me, this runs counter to the intent of the land-grant mission and threatens to limit extension's capability to serve the needs of the people of this state. Therefore, to preserve the public orientation of the extension mission, it seems important to highlight the public good. So if we can agree that higher education generates significant private and public benefit, and if the private benefits are common knowledge, what can universities do to improve understanding of the greater good? To me, this is the key challenge confronting higher education as a whole as the pendulum swings toward privatization and away from the public good, which forms the backbone of the land-grant university. The challenge of moving the public mindset from private gain to public good is monumental, in part because we emphasize the private good in our messages and remain essentially silent on the public good, which is certainly more difficult to communicate. As I say, I lost, lost my place here. The challenge that we have is to face this difficulty and to accept the urgent need to develop new messages that help all citizens gain a deeper understanding of public benefit through a two-way dialogue 
with a cross-section of the public. And to me, that's what extension does. I believe university leaders working in partnership with leaders in other key sectors can play a leading role in this citizen education effort. There's no substitute for citizen leadership, and there's no equal. Neither is there a non-governmental organization beyond the university with the potential to bring key sectors together in common cause. The land-grant university has earned a special place in citizen education. Its presence is statewide, not to mention national and international. Its legions of active alumni and friends across the state represent all sectors of modern society. What organization is better positioned to lead and mobilize citizen education focused on the greater good? I can't think of one. Now this daunting task will require strong leadership and cooperation within higher education and beyond. And it will certainly require the dedication and vision of our most talented leaders. Now this is the type of worthy challenge that Bryce Ratchford enjoyed. It's a challenge that must be met. It's a golden moment that recalls Tocqueville's observations on citizen engagement in the 19th century America. In Democracy in America, he wrote, and I quote, in the United States, as soon as several inhabitants have taken an opinion or an idea which they wish to promote in society, what do they do? They seek out each other and unite together. And from that moment, they are no longer isolated, but have become a power seen from afar. The land-grant university of the 21st century through extension in cooperation with citizen leaders resonates with that power seen from afar. What a perfect time to take the lead. Thanks, Ron. Anybody have a, one of those burning comments or questions for him? Okay, if not, Rob? Your turn. <laughs> Extension's role has been and rightly remains to take the university to an extraordinary people. An extraordinary people interested in the great innovations and the profound insight produced by their university. Extraordinary people interested to know how the products of our academic endeavors will improve their lives. Extraordinary people who, though they may never come to this campus, realize that knowledge is power. Solving the grand challenges of tomorrow, like feeding 10 billion people, preventing catastrophic disease, easing social strife, protecting the environment, and helping future generations live in a just and happy society surely depends on new knowledge. And we at MU are up to that task. We have fantastic engineers and doctors and nurses and educators, and nutritionists, veterinarians, programmers, biologists, physiologists, and geneticists and accountants and lawyers and historians and geographers and artists and chemists and physicists, mathematicians, statisticians, philosophers, Journalists, geologists, psychologists, sociologists, economists, and probably a dozen more I've forgotten. Without doubt, all will be instrumental in solving the challenges of the future. And the new knowledge produced by these academicians in the future will both please and shock us. The future holds great challenges for us all and especially the extension workers who will shape and deliver our university to our people. Changes in extension programs and delivery methods will evolve in ways that will make most of us raised in the idea of public funding for public good. They will make us apprehensive and uncomfortable and even mortified at times. The affected extension programs tomorrow might include embedded extension workers. For instance, an engineer co-funded by his own company and MU Extension, 
a model that shortens the pipeline between academic innovation and useful product. Or a nurse, again, co-funded by MU Extension and perhaps a rural hospital who speeds patient recovery by applying new therapies from our medical school. Or a food technologist with a direct connection to MU laboratories who brings the latest innovations in food safety to one of our food processors. Or perhaps a city manager working with MU's community development program that helps a town build on the concepts produced by a team of academicians and citizen scholars. This embedded model would reach to where citizens encounter the great knowledge produced by our land-grant university. Or the extent, effective extension programs to tomorrow might take a slightly different route. Perhaps we should give the entire university an extension appointment. A community where all faculty and staff members embrace the idea that academic excellence includes societal use and impact. To make it happen, we will have to reward it. For instance, engineers reward for how many of their products are in use, or economists for changing the family savings account. Agriculturists reported, reported for improving food production, doctors for innovative therapies, and patients treated. A model where the impact of taking innovation to the marketplace, or the workplace, or even the home place means as much as any academic metric. As we walk the route of innovative extension programs, we will surely encounter challenges. One challenge will be how we deal with new collaborations. We will turn heads when extension workers have one foot in academia and the other foot wearing the shoe of an entrepreneur or social worker. We want to foster, foster good collaborations where information flows seamlessly between innovators and users. Collaborations so deep that eventually we don't know whose idea it was, we just know it was a really good idea. Now the notion of collaboration sounds great. And indeed, research shows that good collaborations provide greater benefits than does hard-nosed competition. However, with collaboration comes the sense that we lose some control. And as educated and proud scholars, that's pretty hard for us to take sometimes. And yet, when we fix our eyes on the extraordinary people, those extraordinary people clamoring for the fruits of academic achievement, we see that the future of extension demands programming and delivery as pioneering as the knowledge that it hopes to impart. The future of extension is the same as its present, an extraordinary university delivering knowledge to an extraordinary people. How about now? Anybody got a comment or a question? Yes. So, Rob, are we, Rob, are we on that path, or is there something we need to do to get onto it? You know, I think we're, we're headed in some of these directions. I think we're, at this point, still a little scared about what some of these new kinds of programs will be. We are, we are used to saying, look, here's some public funding. You go do something that has some great good for people. What is harder for us to sort of capture at times is how do we do that in concert with the private sector so that we are able to move innovation rapidly into the marketplace or to where it's needed. And sometimes those collaborations look a little messy or maybe even with some sort of conflict of interest that we have not yet fully come to grips with. Okay, hang on to that thought because we'll probably get a chance to come back to it. So next, Michael Cook. Good morning, everyone. Wow, to follow these two guys, it's um, a great challenge. In 1990, a professor, a 50-year-old professor at Indiana University, authored a book published by Cambridge University. Her topic was, are there similarities between long-enduring institutions that provide collective goods to private users. 
She examined over 1,000 long enduring institutions. Some of them were 600 years old. What did she find? Well, she found that um, all of the participants in the collaboration that took place wanted to remain individualistic. But they were faced with uncertainty and they were faced with increasing complexity. They were also obsessed with defining, if they collaborated, a well-defined purpose. So the author, examining for seven or eight years, this is what she found. She came up with seven design principles. Design principle number one, and I remember this extremely, for me, very clear. Um, Bryce Ratchford was on the search committee when I was hired here 25 years ago. And uh, he kept insisting on, all right, Cook, what will be your purpose? Will you define the boundaries clearly? What this author found was the most important thing in designing a long enduring institution is to clearly define the boundaries, both from a human point of view, who can participate, and a geographic point of view. The second thing she found was those who participate, those who appropriate these public goods or collective goods that Ron and Rob talked about, they must be involved in setting the rules. But not just those who appropriate, those who provide. And so she divided everything into appropriators and providers. And she concluded that the successful ones did it in a congruent manner. So they agreed with each other. By the way, included, and I think very relevant uh, for extension, is exit clauses had to be part of the rules. And so when a program ends, maybe that should be discussed ex ante. And she found that the successful ones did that. The third element she found uh, that make up her seven design principles is she called it the collective choice arrangement. That is, the group itself must have the ability to adapt and be involved in changing the rules, particularly the control rules. How will we be governed? A fourth thing she found with respect to successful long enduring organizations was they believed very strongly in accountability. They believed very strongly in monitoring. And she found that those who self monitor had the most success. The fifth thing she found was, and all of us who are parents know this, you must have graduated sanctions. And she found that in general, of these first 1,000 that she studied, they usually had three sanctions. One very light, the second meaningful, and the third very meaningful. And so these had to be enforced. Uh, recently, I just returned from um, uh, East Africa, and I was sitting in front of a board of directors, and they were going through all of the rules they had, and we got to their graduated sanctions. And I said, how do you enforce them? We can't. They're our neighbors. And it was, this organization will probably not make it. Interesting. She was vehement 
in suggesting that all seven of these principles be literally enforced. The, the, sixth, the sixth element of, this, of these successful long enduring institutions was they had to have a conflict resolution mechanism and it should be low cost. The seventh, the organization, and what I'm suggesting here, extension, if we listen to the first two speakers, we will see in the future, in 2040, more well-defined programs that really embed collaboration between appropriators and providers. There must be a recognition by a higher institutional force, a state, a university, a federal system. It must recognize the ability to collaborate in adaptive and unique forms. And finally, she noted the large ones developed nested enterprises, meaning it was a federated system uh, where groups would build on top of each other. Now note, the results challenge two traditional themes of organization. Pre-1990, there were two accepted ways to organize if you wanted to prevent chaos. Top-down or coercion or privatize. In a sense, we've heard about both of those. She suggested there was a middle way. And this observed middle way of organizing in many ways is not new to some of you in extension. But this more collaborative, appropriator provider, self-monitoring, adaptive and well-defined purpose and user might address some of the current challenges being faced by extension. Some of these uh, challenges might be termed under relevance, responsiveness, silos, serving anyone who asks, and a degree of integration within the system. Since 1990, these speculative, and she called them, these are just my, I've only observed a thousand. Uh, this is purely speculation on my part. These design principles have been critically reviewed and empirically tested and they're now considered to be very robust in the science of organizational design. The author, Eleanor Ostrom, won the Nobel Prize in economics in the year 2009, the first woman to do so. A marvelous human being. She passed away in the year 2012, and yet she left a tremendous legacy in that the workshop she founded with her husband is now larger than when she lived. And they continue to study how to, how to create this middle way in developing efficient and equitable organizational design. Perhaps in the year 2040, we will celebrate the institution of extension as robust as her original 1,000. We surely hope so. Thank you. So this is the audience participation part of the program. Uh, we want to make sure that you uh, have the opportunity to make comments, ask questions, and we'll also be open to uh, asking questions of each other. Uh, but who has, a, who has a question or a comment? We've heard the range from the, from the organizational structure, private to public, uh, new ideas about embeddedness uh, and, and theory and, and characteristics of future organizations. And I think Steve Devlin has a comment or question. Uh, yeah, my question is for Dr. Turner. Um, I appreciate your position when it comes to the difference between public and private good, but 
part of my question is, is how do you make a distinction between what is private good and public good and how in this interconnected world that we live in uh, that you can make a say, okay, that's a private good, so we're not going to support that because it doesn't actually have any public good to it. So I, that's my question. That's a terrific question. And uh, the answer I would suggest to you is found in a book that should be required reading in higher education. It's a book by an economist at the University of Illinois. His name is Walter McMahon. And the title of his book is Higher Learning, Greater Good. And he recognizes exactly the point, Steve, that you made, that there are these private benefits. And from a university standpoint, we know who gets that private benefit. Those are the people who enroll in extension programs, they enroll in credit courses, they enroll in degree programs. And certainly when the degree holders finish, what do they have? Increased marketability for their talent, increased income, essentially for their lifetime, and a better quality of life for themselves and their families. And that's the private good. And we all love that. That's what built American higher education because you go all the way back to the Morrell Act. That's, that's where we came from, helping people who can then advance up the socioeconomic ladder. McMahon, though, defines the public good. And, and here are a few of them. One is, and this is all in the book, improved civic institutions. That's in everybody's good. Political stability. Now, you can argue about that depending on what the political philosophy is. But political stability derives as the public good. He also mentions greater life expectancy. The quality of life for everybody in the pool grows as a result of higher education. And he's tracked this. Poverty reduction. Lower crime rates, lower health care costs, and increased social capital. Now, he has a whole book on each of these public uh, chapters on each of these public benefits. But you see the distinction. And that's not to say that people who get degrees, make more money, create better communities, uh, don't add to the public good, because they certainly do. But it's this accumulation of private good that generates the public good that McMahon has defined. Is that some way responsive? I, I just recommend McMahon to anybody who's interested in this issue. Rob or Mike, you want to add in anything there? I might comment. The um, economists define public good. As, they look at everything from the point of view is, can you exclude anyone else from using the good? And a private good is one of those. And is it subtractable? If this good is used, it does not remain for anyone else. So to be a private good, you have to meet both of those criteria. To meet a public good, you have to say no to both of those. And Ron mentioned a whole set of public goods, per se. Now, extension is taking public knowledge, public goods, and translating them into private goods to whoever is using it. Okay. And certainly the uh, extension director in me would say one of the first ways to get to the, to the process is to say, is somebody taking the educational information that we're providing, the educational program we're, make, we're using and providing, and making money with it? That's what ought to get us into that process of analyzing further. Other comments or questions? Yes, David. Ron, this kind of addressed all three of you, but probably more you. Uh, in the 70s, when Bryce was looking at restructuring Missouri Extension and, and the new model, we've been in that for a period of time. And you look nationally what's going on right now with 106 boards of directors nationally to have to make decisions, or in the state, 114 county councils and others making decisions. I guess the question I'd ask is, is now the time that we ought to have a conversation about what the new extension model needs to look like? Because as we look at federal funding, it's flat. 
Look at state funding, it's flat. The only one we kind of see growing is counties to some extent. We're not keeping up with inflation in that, by any means or time. And I guess my question to you is, is this the time for a Ratchford era to look at what we're at and where we need to go in the future and how we structure ourselves in the future? I think the answer is yes, um, but I wouldn't limit it to extension. Extension is a key part of a university mission. It's integral. In fact, it's what defines the public land-grant university, separates it from the Wash U's and the St. Louis U's and the community colleges and everybody else. That's who we are. So the answer is yes. But Dave, you talk about the resource constraints that I don't have to say any more about because we're all living those in, in, in the public sector. Uh, how do we change that? I believe the only way we change it is for those of us in this enterprise, in this sector of higher education, to focus on the public good we do. Because until the ordinary citizen in Missouri makes that connection, in Jefferson City, we're gonna have Groundhog Day year after year after year. We can spend millions on lobbyists in Jefferson City or Washington or Brussels or wherever you want to go. But until the mindset of the public makes that connection, we're basically at Groundhog Day. That's why I'm trying to advocate that institutions work together to focus on the public good. Because the more people who show up elected in Jefferson City who understand the public good will eliminate the need for lobbyists. It's like trying to reform a casino <laughs> as long as we do what we're doing. We have to try something different. And in my view, what we need to try that we haven't tried is for universities to come together in common cause to promote the public good. Private good takes care of itself. Market forces will propel that. So that's the best I can do, Dave. Any, any other comments from the panelists on this? Rob or Mike? No? OK. We've got another one here. John? All right, thanks. Uh, I appreciate the session. I wanted to bring the talk around to you know, what historically were our county agents and now are, you know, we call them regional specialists or regional faculty, whatever term you want to, want to have. And you know, I really think that thinking about that level of our organization has always been a key part of what our success has been and I think ultimately will be a key part of our success in the future. You know, we think about what extension brings and they can bring to the field and it's, you know, it's that connection to the community you know, it's integrity and impartiality. Those are some of the things that people associate with extension. I also want to just share as we think about them a little bit of the experience I've had being in Australia where they linked their extension very closely to industry and that it disappeared because people felt as though, well, if everything extension does is just industry, I get industry every day. Why am I also bringing this person along? So as you, I guess I would like the panel to talk instead of quite at the level they were at that global level, maybe to look up a little bit from that level and talk about where the long view is, how you see those individuals succeeding and remaining an integral part of our institution. So to really focus on where, where we're uh, at locally, at the local level. Start the descent. We're at 36,000 feet. Let's get down to 10. Here. OK. Who'd like to take a shot at that? Certainly our best connection to the people is at that, at the, that local level and, and those regional specialists or, or whatever term we're, we're applying to that is the group in which we need to have a strong connection from here with. And, and one of the things I think we have to do as an organization, and we try to do this, but we frankly have got to get better at, is, is being sure that that connection from what we do as innovative things here reaches them and they not only do they know about it but they feel a part of it 
And, and so that's, the, that's sort of the, the community of academicians that we really have to, to think about. And because of their distance from campus in many cases, they don't always feel that same connectedness that, that we need to have them feel. And, and so we need to think of organizational structures and opportunities and, and frankly, a, a level of collegiality that, that it makes them feel like that they are, are, are a central part of what we do, not just you know, delivering the information that I came up with yesterday. Honor Mike, you want to take a shot at that? Go ahead. Go ahead. Sarah, correct? Yes. Uh, I think you're right to try to bring us back down to uh, earth. And that's what I'm trying to do. Uh, I want to challenge our current leadership to focus on the public good. I'm alone in that battle, essentially because nobody wants to talk about that. But until we do, we're going to get the same result. The answer to your question is, I think, instead of having how many full-time positions you have, 300 or? And if you look at, uh, if you're, you're probably about that, if you look at full-time faculty kinds of positions. The answer to your, to your question, I believe, is to get back up to seven or 800 full-time positions. Because when you've done that, then you're making these connections at a very practical and personal level that Rob talked about. But until you get to that point, you're stewing in your own juice. So that's, we have to take a long view. It's what this is about. We have to stand up on the back of the horse and look out to what's happening. I, I, could, I could give you an anecdote from a focus group in a little town where we did some testing on this. And I sat with a good friend of the University of Missouri, a donor, holds a professional degree, big supporter of the university. And I said, well, how's your business? And he said, oh, it's great. And I said, really, why is it so great? And he said, well, because the ag economy is so good. He's an attorney. He said, things are great. I said, oh, you mean producers are, are, are enjoying this uh, economy? He said, yeah. And I said, well, are they farming today the way they did 30 years ago? And he said, oh, no. He said, we're using GPS, and we have all these farming. And I said, where do you think that technology came from? And his jaw dropped open. Here was one of our friends who was benefiting privately, who didn't make this connection of public investment in this university. We have, if our friends don't get it, what in the world can we do? That's why citizen education, I think, is essential. Sorry. Mike? I, I just want to bring up the, uh, uh, Rob mentioned uh, collaboration and collegiality. I think a really important role that extension people have to play is that of healthy tension. If you are performing as a provider of public good, you are probably going to challenge the biases and thoughts of many of your users. This courage needed to be, to create uh, a relationship where healthy tension is appreciated becomes really critical. And courses, not courses, but training in critical thinking and the ability, the story that Ron just told, the ability to have many, many stories like that to support why I'm challenging you, Mr. User, uh, or Miss User. Because this, um, if we're providing public good, we are, in a sense, raising the level of critical thinking in the populace. As a quick moderator editorial comment, I would just simply add to this discussion to, to say that we, uh, we had lost uh, our regular conversations with councils in the, in the state. I think it probably was because we no longer had a five-year federal plan of work process to get back to council members in local communities asking them what they need seeing how we did on delivering that need, in other, in other words, closing the loop. And we've started back to do that 
after an absence of I don't know how many years, a few years, because of the change of the federal plan of work. And that process, as we've evolved it, because we realized that we weren't making the closing loop on it very well, I think is another thing that has to happen in extension, and we've got to do it on a regular basis and listen to what the people on the councils who, who are elected or appointed, mostly elected, to tell us what the needs are. And then we need to be responsive to them when they tell us something. How about that? Yes, Mary? I have a question for all three of you. Um, one or two word answer if you can. And I know that'll be a challenge, but try. <laughs> what do you see as the most significant single factor affecting and effecting public perception of higher education, specifically extension, as the economic engine of the states? Okay, who would like to take that one first? I'll, I'll take a shot at it. The, the reason I referenced Eleanor Ostrom, she believed very strongly that what's happening is our populace is becoming increasingly uh, entitled and not taking control of their own destiny. And so one of the things, if, if, if you go through my notes, through her seven design principles, it was saying, if you really want a better life, you will have to organize and you will have to do it yourself. I have worked with Grameen, pe people who have no more than a hundred hundred dollars a year in net income and they are collaborating or making a difference. And so we've lost some of that and I would argue that extension and university researchers and teachers have to emphasize and celebrate the importance of being a Teddy Roosevelt, if you're watching the Roosevelt, I mean really taking control of your own situation of, of, and doing it collaboratively. And that's why I mentioned her seven design principles because many people want to do this, but they will only do three of those design principles. And she just, she, she just has files and files and files of failures who don't do all seven. I mean, she gleaned these from the successful ones. So healthy tension, and you must, you, 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 you have to take control of your own destiny back into your own hands. Rob, you want to jump in there? Sure. I, I think to kind of, if I get the essence of your question about being an economic engine or a driver for the state, I don't know that they always, the public perceives that we are in commerce, that they see that we are a part of those marketplaces and those places where innovation has come from the university, just like maybe Ron mentioned a moment ago in, in the agricultural example, they don't always see our role in, in that. And so maybe we've had sort of this hidden role that we need to be perhaps just to tell people more about, but I, I think if the more we embed people in the idea of commerce, the more people will see us as part of the marketplace, and I think then we'll be seen as important, more important in that economic engine. Okay, Ron? I have about four words that I wrote down, Mary, when you asked that. My answer is disorganized competition within and among the higher education sector. The higher education sector is an intense competition for the reasons that Rob alluded to. As a sector, we're also disorganized. Every institution paddles its own canoe furiously, 24 hours a day, night and day. Nobody's paddling the big canoe, the sector canoe. If we were in banking or engineering or law, we would have a sector presence and a sector voice. The way we do it in higher education, we tell our own story. We don't tell the big story. That's my answer. We, uh, we as institutions are competitors most of the time, head to head, and if we're not, we're what we affectionately call loosely held confederations. And uh, usually there's not a lot of one story coming out of loosely held confederations. 
Well, let me just say that Mike's point, I think, speaks directly to that. Competition, cooperation. We spend all of our time focusing on the dynamics of competition, beating the next guy or the next girl, instead of figuring out how we can cooperate in the way that Rob suggested with other sectors. First, we have to get our own sector together. That's a big job. Nobody wants to do it. We have another one here. Ron, I know that, uh, that you've got a group of folks that you've been working with uh, over time to try to address uh, some of these kinds of things in an environment that's very unique to the Missouri environment in terms of its willingness to tax itself for education and so forth. Can you talk just a little bit about that and where you're at on that? Well, when I retired, I asked myself, what can I do to help change this paradigm? I hate to use that word, but that was the question. And I said to myself, I could, I could go to every county in the state, 114 counties, go one at a time, meet with leaders in the counties, and start a dialogue with people back at the university. That's all I would do, circuit right. But instead, I found about 10 or 12 leading citizens, including representatives from Bass Pro Shop, Edward Jones in St. Louis, other institutional board members, who when I talked to them, they said, tell me what you want me to do. And they would do it. There is a bed out there of interest among leading citizens, but higher education, I believe, has to take the lead. So I call this group the Missouri Citizen Higher Education Coalition. And in order to do this focus group, I went on my cell phone and my computer to raise money for the focus groups. It's the easiest fundraising I've ever done. Within two weeks, we had the money to do the focus groups. And everybody I talked to said, just tell me what you want me to do. That's the question. What are we going to do? Sorry. Let me, uh, let me ask each of the panelists if, if, if there's a last key thought or idea that you'd like to leave with the group. Uh, the question about coming down from 37 and a half thousand feet, uh, I, it made me think of um, the land grant universities have joined in the, in the battle to not be different. And I think we really need to go back to what our original mission was. I think the reason you ask us to come down from 37 is because we compete with them in journal publications and everything else when we really should be thinking how can we be more relevant to the intended user. And we would have a very different language. Rob, last comment? My last comment is, is that uh, I would say that extension is underrated, and the people who underrate it most is us. And so it's, it's really up to us to, to, to be better. We have a lot of great people. We have a lot of great ideas and a lot of things to offer, and we, and we, need, to, uh, we need to offer those things to people. When we do, I think the rest of it takes care of itself. Well, finally, I would say that if you look at the college going rate in the state of Missouri, uh, the lowest county with a, holding a baccalaureate degree across the population is McDonald County. Has anybody ever been to McDonald County, Pineville? 11 percent of the people in McDonald County hold a bachelor's degree. And the highest percentage of degree holders in this uh, state, you know where that county is? Right here, St. Louis, urban, suburban St. Louis, Kansas City, a little behind us. My goal is to live long enough to be standing in line at break time and hear, to hear a black elderly woman say to someone else, you can't believe how important the University of Missouri is to me. That's my goal, to live that long. Thank you all. Let's thank this panel.
And thank you all for being here and participating in this event. Uh, as you know, we've got it uh, recorded, so we are going to make sure that those of our organization that can't be here today can, can have it, and it'll be widely, it'll be widely available. Thank you all.